Hey guys, it's Vive Mitro's Warhammer Tactics Series, and today we're gonna talk about the Grey Knights, the 666th chapter of Space Marines. And without further ado, let's dive right in. And as usual, we'll discuss their strength first, and obviously their biggest strength is that they are psychic Space Marines. So they're not only good at killing and shooting and melee, they are also great at smiting and doing stuff with their minds opens up a whole bunch of strategical and tactical possibilities that simply aren't there for the regular space marines for example smiting your way out of combat teleporting yourself across the board dealing th wounds in three phases to special targets like gas abaddon satans and etc denying psychic powers in the places where opponent your opponent does not expect it because when your whole army can deny it's not that easy it's actually very hard to get out of range of your denial as compared to something like an army with one librarian where it's very easy to control the area that the librarian can deny. Obviously do psychic actions like the mental interrogation and the purifying ritual, the Grey Knights secondary. So all in all a very different approach uh, compared to what the usual regular space marines do in their games and can do on the battlefield. Their army rule gives them a lot of extra survivability against those mortal wounds and the otherworldly threats. So a 5-up shrug against mortal wounds and also plus 1 to deny the witch tests. It actually is a great help, especially a 5-up shrug against mortals part, because when you have a very, very elite models, the worst part is when a tank blows up nearby and kills like one and a half of your guys or a whole Terminator and you can do nothing about that. With Grey Knights, you have a very, very good chance of saving that model and not losing those wounds. That's why they aren't that easy to deal with, for example, for armies like Eldar, Tyranids or Thousand Suns who like to do a lot of damage in the psychic phase. Grey Knights have this awesome army rule called Masters of the Warp that allows them to basically pre-game select a mode, a psychic mode in which the army will operate until it's changed. There is only one way to change this mode. It's by casting a special psychic power from the Dominus Discipline, which is the one that all your characters get access to. And usually you will be in one of the two tides. So the Tide of Shadows, which is a defensive one, and the Tide of Convergence, which is an offensive one. They give you a whole bunch of efficiency and especially if you know when to change them and which you should turn on at which point. And that's what comes with experience. But usually you want to start in tides in tide of shadows, which gives your units light cover if they are more than 12 inches away from the thing that shoots them and if they are already in a ruin and already receive the benefit of light cover they get dense cover instead so they get light cover from the ruin and dense cover from the tide of shadows it's a great rule obviously you really like the cover saves on space marines especially now with armor of contempt when the ap is so much less efficient against them and uh shaving off that extra ap point in addition to armor of contempt from your opponent's weapons is Awesome. Before the recent FAQ, this rule was even more powerful because you could receive that dense cover bonus even if you were shot at uh, like within three inches uh, and you were inside the ruin. So you did get the light cover from the ruin and you got the dense cover because of this tide of shadows. There was no clause that said that you have to be further than 12 inches to receive the dance cover part. Only the light cover part was limited like that. Now you have to be more than 12 inches to get any bonus from the Tide of Shadows, which is probably correct way to use it. And the Tide of Convergence gives you two things. So plus six inches to your range, uh, to range of your Psy guns, uh, which are like Psy cannons on your Dread Knights. And also you do mortal wounds on sixes to wound with your nemesis weapons in combat up to six per enemy unit. So you can do six to one squad that you've charged and six to another if you had enough sixes roll. Before this limitation, this tide of convergence was just stupid and crazy because you could do so many mortal wounds to the target. I have uh, played a game once where I've charged a, a unit of Blight Lord Terminators with my 10 
strike marines and they've just they've wasted half a squad just on mortal wounds because i've had hammerhead on them hammerhead is a psychic power in the sanctic discipline which allows you to reroll all wound rolls in melee and uh, so they've done so many mortal wounds just bef even before the actual wound started coming through the invulnerable save on the blight lords so i'm actually happy that they've changed this rule because six wound mortal wounds sounds a bit more reasonable so i really like this two tides of course there are some others like tide of celerity which allows you to count as having rolled uh, a three on your advances and charges each time you roll a one or a two which is great but obviously it's much less important than the tide of shadows and tide of convergence there is another against demons but all in all, you'll probably be using these two all the time. They work especially great because when you, you the first or the second turn have passed and you probably know that you will not be anywhere close to being 12 inches away from the enemy until the end of the turn, end of the battle, sorry. You will probably want to turn on the Tide of Convergence and leave it on. So you will be benefiting from those sixes to wound doing mortals all the time on all your characters, all your small squads. They will all be doing that cheap damage, additional damage to the enemy. And we all know how effective the mortal wounds are when they are en masse like that. So as we discussed, the whole army are psychers, so even your dreadnoughts, all your characters, your troops, so everything in the in the army except the transports and uh, land raiders uh, they all can cast and uh, it means that you have access to certain disciplines but unlike the thousand sons who can select what they want to cast uh, before the battle as usual uh, the gray knights they can only do that on your characters who know the dominus discipline uh, so your regular units like troops like dreadnoughts they have smite they know smite and they know one fixed power from the sanctity discipline so for example the strike squads they know they only know hammer hand and they cannot choose to uh, know other powers they only know this one it's not actually that bad as it sounds the only thing that i miss is having a reserve squad of strike mains with the gate of infinity in on my home objective that can teleport and uh, steal an objective somewhere at the end of the battle which was something that i used extensively in 8th edition now that one is gone and i can only do the psychic action probably when my strike squad is waiting uh, for my guys on the home objective but anyways it's not that bad and you can still use your psychic marines very efficiently especially considering that your character still can select their psychic powers as normal obviously green knights have a whole bunch of stratagem to boost their psychic potential they can boost the range of psychic powers by six inches they can roll 3d6 and pick two to cast and to deny these are two separate stratagems we're talking they can cast an additional power as usual as the blood angels can as the thousand suns can they can change psychic powers on the unit of paladins that's their special thing that the paladins unlike all the other sanctic type squads they can select their uh, psychic powers uh, they are not fixed because they are like amalgamation of all the disciplines they are masters of that particular discipline so they know everything and they can select two before the battle for each squad and almost all of your units can dip strike without any uh, command points or anything being spent before the battle you can just select to put anything in the teleportation chamber and then teleport it from your second turn anywhere on the battlefield within nine inches of the enemy it was an awesome ability back in eighth edition but unfortunately nowadays when there is so little space on the board and you are risking being screened right back into your deployment zone if you decide to put something in reserves i usually leave everything on the board even when i have the chance to reserve something but perhaps maybe a single squad of five strike marines is something that you would want to leave in your back pocket in case you need to take some far away objective from your opponent other problem with that is that gray knights don't get any almost any buffs to your charges you literally get one single rule that allows you to roll an eight instead of a nine from dip strike it's a warlord trade first to the fray which used to be a cool aura of reroll and charges within six for all the 
uh, Grey Knight's units. Nowadays it's only a plus one to the charges for the Warlord and if the Warlord makes a successful charge then all the units, other Grey Knight's units that try to charge that target that the Warlord is within engagement range of, they also get the plus one to the charges. But for example if you want just to want to charge something from Deep Strike, like a unit of Terminators wants to charge something from Deep Strike, you will have to roll that 9. If you thought that there are enough things that make Grey Knight special, not like everyone else, you are mistaken, because they also are equipped with force weapons, damage two swords basically, like a mastercrafted swords. The whole army, so all your troops, all your Terminators, all your characters, everyone has a force weapon, which is incredible, and it's basically what you change for the limited psychic potential as compared to the uniquely psychic armies like the Thousand Suns. Because all in all your Strike Marine has a Storm Bolt or he has a Force Weapon and he can make three attacks with that. He can also cast the Smite. So they are like the Swiss Army Knife of Space Marines. They can do everything and that's why you have to sacrifice something and in this case uh, they sacrifice the efficiency of their Psychic Potential. And yeah, having Storm Bolters on all your troops and your Terminators is also a big, big plus because it provides you with volumes of bolter fire which is very important sometimes to, to clear out hordes units like box walkers cultists and other chaff that sits on objectives and is not as powerful as to waste some real firepower on them but when each of your squads has up to 20 shots with the bolters if it's a yeah, five-man squad and if they are within the rapid fire range you can actually clear out some stuff with that. Now let's walk through the weaknesses. First of all, as mentioned already, they are not as proficient and reliable in the psychic phase as the direct impetor Thousand Suns. They don't get any, almost any pluses to their casts. Uh, their psychic powers have high warp charge values, usually not. Like for example, the new Space Marine, KS Space Marine Codex, has a psychic power that allows you to revive a model within 18 inches of the psyker. And how much do you think you need to roll on the dice to cast it? A 5. On two dice, a 5. They get command points hungry to a whole new level because they spend, they waste command points, I should say, in each of the phases. Uh, they want to spend those in the melee, they want to spend those in the shooting and in the psychic phases. And they really, really need to because, for example, the stratagem to use the cybolt ammunition on your bolters, which makes your bolters AP1 and also gives you auto wound on a 6 to hit. This one costs 1 command point if it's for a unit of 5 models and 2 if it's a unit of 10. Which does not sound that bad, but when you stack that with something that you used in the melee phase and something that you used in the, they've used in the psychic phase, you quickly start to run out of command points. And there are no good ways to restore those in this book, unlike the aforementioned Thousand Suns, which can just spend the four Cabal points and get the command point back. Yes, you can go for the Pressing Brethren uh, Brotherhood, but you will have to spend the Warlord trade, a command point on the Warlord trade, to actually have a chance to then roll a six on your Warp Charge, spend that cast on the character to have a chance to get the command point, which sounds as bad as it actually is. As a Swiss army knife, they are obviously expensive and you pay quite a lot for your models, apart from some uh, very, very nice uh, deals like the Strike Marine, which is, aren't really expensive and they are probably a slightly under costed. But all everything is pretty much uh, as it should cost, so you will be forced to be careful otherwise you'll be losing some very very expensive models and trading units for objectives is much harder with grey knights because you don't really want to lose anything in this army and the last one as an army full of psychers you should be prepared to get aboard <laughs> each and every great game that you play against someone who does not uh, have psychers in their army and in my opinion in my experience uh in the tournament usually you get like two or one or two of those games uh, where your opponent has this automatic 12 uh, or automatic 15 secondary against you. Obviously if you've won uh, like a complete victory where you've just stabled them 
before they could do anything, then they will not get this that well. But in all the close games, your opponent will actually be somewhere near maximizing that secondary. And now the army composition. There are several unconventional ways you can build Grey Knights. You can go for the Terminator spam. It's when you fill out your troops with only the Terminators and you just have a whole bunch of three wound bodies on the table and you move forward and smite and say like, do whatever you want, I will be holding those objectives as I am OPSEC, because Terminators in Grey Knights, the ones that are the troops, they get OPSEC as all troops do. You can also go for Strike Marine Interceptor Squad Spam, because Strike Marines are very, very price efficient, and Interceptors, even though they are much more expensive, they also are pretty efficient and very fast, so you can just spam those and only have a couple of characters and a whole bunch of uh, two wound bodies on the table. It's a slightly different version of the first option. You can look back to 8th edition and uh, try to use multiple Paladin Bombs. So that's uh, the stuff that I tried to use in 8th edition. Edition and I was pretty successful with that when you just bring one paladin bomb and try to do max damage with that and the other one is in deep strike then you come down with the other and your opponent is overwhelmed and everything everyone is happy on the gray knight side but it does not really happen like that usually in the games of ninth edition because there are some other factors that weren't there in uh, back in eighth but still that's something that you can do but we are here to look at the balanced force because that's something that I recommend to at least first try to build that and see how it works. And if you feel that you want to go and specialize your list in some shape or form, you will at least have a basic idea of how the army operates. And I feel that the Grey Knights are an army that usually works best in a balanced configuration. The way to build the Grey Knights is to maximize what they can do in the shooting and fight phases without actually sacrificing on the psychic potential. Let's try to do just that. We'll start out with the meat of our list. It's usually where I start when I build my lists. And we can either go for several Dread Knights or Venerable Dreadnoughts. Usually people really, really love Dread Knights. But to be honest, the more I play Grey Knights, the more I realize that I like Dreadnoughts more. I know that people were mesmerized in 9th edition when the Grey Knights codex dropped and the Weave saw that the Dread Knights received an awesome buff that they got the 4-up and Venerable save instead of a 5-up. And they also received an extra wound and we were very very happy but to be honest that was a bit misleading because back in 8th edition when we all used the Dread Knights we loved to use the Grand Master model which already had the 4-up invulnerable save but we also could cast Sanctuary on that model and have a 3-up invulnerable save instead. And we can also use the Hit the Prognostic R stratagem to bump up the invulnerable on the second one to a 3-up so we could have two great Dread Knight Grand Masters with a 3-up and Vulnerable save on the table. And to be honest, those Dread Knights did a bunch of damage, much more than the normal Dread Knights do nowadays, because they got more attacks, they had a stratagem that allowed them to reroll once to wound and for the damage roll and also get an extra attack. They could also reroll once to hit innately, because that's what was the 8th edition about. Most importantly, they had the 3-up and once, so it was actually pretty hard to do deal with them. Where nowadays, when everything is so much killier and deadlier in the Warhammer universe, and things like Abaddon stride the battlefields with their 300 point price tag and the ability to kill Primarchs, that extra wound that they've generously bestowed upon us is not something that will compensate the loss of the 3 plus invulnerable save and everything else. So that's why I really like the venerable dreadnoughts nowadays, because they get minus one damage as they are dreadnoughts which is incredibly important nowadays with all those damage to weapons all around the game also they get six up feel no pain they get armor of contempt because dreadnoughts don't get it they get armored resilient psychic power that allows them to cast a plus one save on themselves so they will be able to have a one up save against stuff so it's like a five up invulnerable save against a multi melter shot but with six up feel no pain and the with minus one damage. They got the 2 plus ballistic skill and 2 plus weapon skill. A whole bunch of attacks, 5 attacks at damage 3. They don't degrade. They cost 30 points less in the full configuration and they also get smoke launchers which allows them to have the minus one to hit when they need to. So on paper the Dread Knights do sound cooler but in reality I found them to 
be too easy to kill and underwhelming. Plus their shooting doesn't do much in the current meta game because they don't have enough AP unlike the multi melters which at least have a minus 4 AP. It sounds very funny at least minus 4 but that's actually how the game operates now. You really need to cast Empiric Amplification on the target for the shooting attacks of the Dread Knights to make them work. It's a psychic power that allows you to have plus 1 damage on your Psy and Nemesis weapons on the particular target. So I'll go for 3 Venerable Dreadnoughts with Multi Melters. To have speed apart from teleportation with the Gate of Infinity Psychic Power and the Dip Strikes, which is, we already discussed why they're not that reliable, I recommend to have 10 to 15 Interceptors. They are like a Strike Marines, but just have a pseudo fly jump pack on the backpack, uh, which allows them to have a 12 inch move and move through walls and uh, models. They'll help you with the missions and objectives. As for characters you aren't really spoiled for choice, I would always take Drago because he casts two powers unlike the Brother Captains and the Grandmasters, which cast only one power each. And he knows three powers, so he has a great psychic potential for your army. He gives rerolls to Paladins, uh, reroll wants to hit to Paladins and all core units. And he can also give full rerolls to hit to some other thing. I would also recommend to have a brother captain, it's a lieutenant in the Grey Knights army because you want to reroll those ones to wound with your strike mains and your dreadnoughts. Same goes for the librarian, they are useful because they can cast two powers and also they can choose a power from the Sanctic Discipline and the Dominus Discipline, not only just the Dominus Discipline like other characters. Also if you run Paladins or Terminators in numbers, so 10 models plus, I would invest in the Apothecary because his 6 sub shrug aura is extremely important to make the damage 3 weapons less efficient against you and also uh, restoring one uh, paladin that costs 45 points for just one command point isn't bad either. Especially if you use that model and put him in the engagement range further forward to the opponent, which will shorten your charge distance. It's a nice trick, which I recommend to use. As for troops, you cannot go wrong with three units of five strike squads. They cost 110 points each, are very survivable with the Armor of Contempt now, have 16 attacks with damage 2, and Storm Boulders, which can shoot twice if you've stood still. You can also go for Terminators, but we've already discussed it. You need to build around that to make it work. And the Battalion is your only good option as a detachment. Now let's talk about the special characters. First of all, Drago. He is a beefy Chapter Master, casts 2, denies 2, knows 3, as we've already discussed. Chapter Master rerolls and reroll ones to hit and he's the only model that can give paladins rerolls but well, that's why you want him in all your lists relatively tanky two plus save one up with armor of contempt three plus invulnerable seven wounds six attacks at strength eight ap4 damage three with his great sword titan sword mastercraft storm bolt or four shots at strength four ap1 damage two as all the main characters have the brother captains the grandmasters and etc he costs 180 points but he's worth it anyways i really want them to look at him very very closely and see that he probably should cost around 170 in my opinion maybe 165. Next cast on crew a melee support character he fights on death fights first if he's within engagement range of a character he has six attacks at strength 5 ap3 damage 2 and on six is to wound he does d3 more to wounds in addition like Abaddon. He can make six inch heroic intervention and he can also move closer to the closest enemy model as usual or into engagement range with the character which can catch people off guard. He has 5 wounds, 2 plus save, so 1 up save with armor of contempt, 4 plus invulnerable save, casts 1, denies 1, and knows 1 power plus purifying flame, and he has plus 1 to cast to this power. The greatest thing about him is that he only costs you 90 points, so if you don't want any other characters in your battalion, you can just go for Drago and cast on Crow. Save up on your relics and traits if you don't want them. Next is the hero of the 8th edition, he's now on the vacation in 9th, but he was just the beast in 8th uh, when you used to be able to use him in any Grey Knights army because there were no brotherhoods back then and you could use him but now when he's a ward maker you probably won't use, see him ever on the tabletop. He is still great, he is a captain, he has 6 attacks with strength 8, AP 3, damage 3 with no minus 1 to hit so just shy, 1 AP point shy of Drago and he casts 
two powers, denies two powers and knows three. Uh, he has six wounds, two plus save and four up in the normal save and cost 150 points. Wardmakers are just not that great of a brotherhood and that's probably why you will not see him on the tabletops. Now let's talk secondaries. First of all, let's discuss Psychic Interrogation, which is obviously not here because I've only included the Grey Knight specific secondaries in this slide, but Psychic Interrogation is great because it's only Warp Charge 4 and only one character, your character needs to attempt to perform a psychic action if they are within 24 inches of an enemy character. And it is pretty easy to achieve because you don't even need to see the character, you just need to be within 24 and you need to roll a 4 on your cast. It's very easy to do with, for example, um, your apothecary uh, who only can cast a single power so you will not be wasting anything. And in addition to that, if the result of the psychic test is equal or greater than the leadership characteristic of an enemy character, which is not that hard to do, for example, if you are selecting a character with a leadership of 8, like like the foul blight spawn in the death guard army you will receive a command point and and at the end of the phase for completing the psychic action which is incredible for such a cp hungry army like gray knights so if for some reason you feel that in your warpcraft category the purifying ritual is not something that you would want to go for the psychic interrogation is a great substitute especially considering that you need to sacrifice several of your casts to get some decent points with the purifying ritual where you only need to sacrifice one with the psychic interrogation next is our beloved purge of the enemy category so our assassination and bringing down and here we will be destroying demons if we destroy any demon monster or any demon vehicle we get three victory points if we destroy any other demon unit we get one and the demon primer costs five but for some reason the secondary was nerfed in 9th edition Nephilim and they decided that at the end of the battle you will be reducing the number of victory points scored from the secondary by one for each demon unit that is on the battle of it and not below half strength or half wounds if it's a vehicle or a monster. This clause is pretty annoying to be honest and I don't think it was necessary to uh, nerf this one so much. Perhaps they needed to adjust the uh, so points values so if you are destroying a demon demon vehicle with nine wounds or less you only get two victory points something like that but subtracting from the victory points that you've already achieved just because there are some demon units on the board left and where you have actually done well in other parts of the game i don't think what that was necessary so perhaps you need to think more about taking the assassination and the bring it down teleport assault secondary i really like this one the idea is very nice it's in the no mercy no respite category where your oath of moment would be but you cannot use it because you're a sanctity castardis you don't get the secondaries from the the space marine book so you get four victory points if one or more enemy units were destroyed by a gray knight's model from your army that was set up on the battlefield using the teleport strike ability teleportation shan stratagem or the gate of infinity power this battle round it's a nice one but you need to plan for it for example you need to put something in deep strike to achieve it with the teleport strike clause you need to use the teleport shan stratagem probably or at least have the gate of infinity psychic power go off each turn and mark sort of mark uh, a unit of yours with the psychic power in order to qualify for those four victory points but actually if you like teleport a small strike squad unit to kill a single uh, cultist standing on an objective and get four victory points for that it's not that bad but you need to plan for it and you need to keep it in mind to actually score something and the purifying ritual we've already discussed this one so you need to do psychic actions on the objectives and if you do them successfully on several objectives you will be getting the victory points not bad but it wastes so much of your psychic potential that even though you are getting victory points which is always great you are sacrificing a whole bunch of what you are actually paying in your army so that's why i feel that psychic interrogation is would be my go-to pick in many games in many instances let's discuss synergies and first start with the grandmaster combo if you decide to run one in addition to drago and you can do that because drago is not technically grandmaster he's a supreme grandmaster and you can have him plus uh, grandmaster in one detachment i recommend to take one in a nemesis dread knight we'll kit him out to make him 
as annoying and survivable as possible. His warlord trait should be first to the fray, the one we've discussed already, and his relic should be the sigil of exigence. Once per game, he can redeploy when he's targeted by a shooting attack. Finally, buy him a servant of the throne upgrade for 15 points to have a once per battle 3 plus invulnerable save on him for a turn until the end of the turn. As for his war gear, I personally like the hammers more than the swords because I like the damage d3 plus 3 and I don't really care about the minus 1 to hit that much. And also I like the AP4 on the hammer. In the current metagame it's very important to have all the AP you can master. As for his uh, ranged weapons, it's obviously the combo of the silencer and the psy cannon. They are both... Uh, pretty good relatively speaking because I don't really like the fact that they don't get the damage 2 on the silencer and the damage 3 on the psychic and innately you need to cast the psychic amplification to get that and also the AP is not that great but anyways these two weapons are the best they are much better than the flamer option. Next interesting combo is the smighty Max Smiterton Librarian. Buy the psychic epitome warlord trade for him. The trade basically allows you to deal an extra mortal wound for each witch fire power he performs so your vortex of doom and the purifying flame which i recommend to put on him vortex of doom is more powerful and it also deals damage to the units within three inches of the targeted unit and the purifying flame is your regular mortal wound power you can keep him on the board and just advance him forward behind the your main lines or drop him whenever there is an opening for a load of mortal wounds you'd have to use the one command point powerful adapt strat to boost the range of the purifying flame psychic power on him because it has a built-in nine inch range and you deploy more than nine inches away i'd also spend one command point for the psychic channel because you want to roll 3d6 on those casts to make sure that they do go off and if for some reason you need to do that extra cast you can use a one command point mental focus to cast an extra smite for example what synergies can we use with the paladins well the best one is obviously the armored resilience psychic power which is the one that the dreadnoughts know innately and the paladins can choose it for themselves and the hammer hands psychic power the armored resilience gives them one up save with armor of contempt so a zero up save constantly and a minus one save in cover which is just bollocks there's also an argument for the ethereal castigation psychic power it allows you to shoot and then make a normal move in the psychic phase but you cannot charge after that it can allow you to move an extra five inches per turn which may be important in some cases but i personally like the armed resilience and hammer hand combo more i don't like the fact that paladins cannot cast two powers innately i would probably love if they could cast two powers if it's a unit of 10 or 9 or more and if it's a unit of 5 then can cast only one it would be more balanced in my opinion the apothecary that strides behind them should have the unyielding and the warlord trade for the obsec on the paladins and double obsec if there are any innately obsec models within six of him and the two command point cybolt ammunition strat the one that we talked about is also great on them it gives them auto wound on hits on hits of sixes and also ap1 on the bolters if you decide to run rapiers which is something that i recommend their stratagem plus psychic power combo is devastating on a 10 man unit of intercept Receptors which do not get access to the hammer hand so that's the way to buff their melee potential that psychic power gives them an extra attack each so 40 attacks on a unit of 10 and their stratagem allows them to have exploding sixes to hit in melee which is amazing on so many attacks sword bearers are also great if you're planning to bring along a lot of vehicles to shoot the empiric amplification the uh, generic psychic power of the gray knights it would be great in that regard and the empiric lodestone the sword bearer specific psychic power that allows you to get plus one to wound on your shooting attacks for vehicles only is also great and it will be a bad day for anyone who's targeted by that if you're planning to dip strike a big squad give them a better chance to survive with one command point hell old in soul fire it's a minus one to hit for a turn after dip striking awesome strategy for interceptors and dread knights with teleporters is fight on the move it can give them an ability to fall back shoot and charge so they are absolutely unobstructed by any enemies nearby the two command point teleport shunt is crazy if you want to establish board presence early you get to redeploy a unit and put them within nine inches of the enemy so like a gate of infinity but you do that with command points instead of casting a psychic power beware that you need to pay for a war gear up upgrade on your Grandmaster and Dread Knight armor 
the teleporter to have the ability to use the teleport shunt and fight on the move so i recommend to pay those points and your interceptors they have that keyword inbuilt one command point thunder stride is a great way to do damage mortal wound damage in the charge phase it allows you to do d3 mortal wounds on a roll of two plus with your dread knight against targets with capped damage per phase it's awesome now let's quickly run through the relics the soul glaive is a great helper that gives you an extra point of ap and full rerolls to hit and wound it's a way to make your apothecary extra dangerous in combat and i really like this relic destroyer of crystal licks a damage for thunder hammer with an extra point of ap again a great relic to make a melee grandmaster if that's something that you want to build banner of refining flame a way to do extra mortal wounds by performing a psychic action and it does d3 to each enemy unit within six awesome relic and it can boost your mortal wound output in the right circumstances artisan nullifier matrix if you have a librarian in your army it's a great one because it allows you to have an aura of no perils within nine inches of him a way to save up on those unnecessary wounds on your guys and cuirass of sacrifice i really like this one because it both adds one to your armor saves and it means that you will have a constant zero plus save on your terminator uh, character and also gives you a five up shrug and i always love a good five up shrug it gives you a theoretical minus two save and cover if you put this relic on the librarian put him in cover and cast armored resilience on himself you will actually have a minus two save in cover so even a minus four weapon will only bring you back to your normal two plus save and here's the list that I've made up for this video. These are rapiers because I believe this brotherhood is the best currently in the meta game. You want to do as much damage to melee as possible and they help you do just that. In the HQs we have Castle and Crow with Hammer of Righteousness, Wall of Trade and Psychic Power, Gate of Infinity. Keldor Drago in uh, the second slot with Vortex of Doom, and Imperial Amplification and Warp Shaping to change those tides. Three units of five strike squads with swords. I believe swords are best now because of their extra AP. Previous I've gone for halberds, but nowadays with armor of contempt, I believe swords are more important. For the elites, I have the aforementioned Brotherhood Apothecary with the Gate of Infinity, Psychic Power, Warlord Trade, Unyielding Anvil, and the Force Sword again. A unit of 10 paladins with halberds and the Nemesis Demon Hammer on the Paragon. I really like a big blob of paladins to have the whole bunch of attacks hidden on twos, and with armored resilience, they are pretty hard to shift. Venerable Dreadnoughts, three of them with multi melters and combat weapons, as we discussed. A unit of 10 interceptors with swords, and a unit of 5 interceptors with swords. I hope this video was useful for you. The Grey Nets aren't easy to master but when you do they are extremely powerful and can be devastating on the tabletop and i hope this video helped you understand them better if you have any questions please let me know in the comments below and i'll see you next time